the next topic is growth hormone or somatotrophin somatotrophin is released in the anterior pituitary by some acidophilic cells now these acidophilic cells produce two hormones one is prolactin the other one is growth hormone the release of growth hormone is stimulated by a hormone synthesized in the hypothalamus called growth hormone releasing hormone it acts on these acidophilic cells causing the release of growth hormone growth hormone releasing hormone is increased it is increased during states of exercise deep sleep puberty that's when growth is highest hypo low glycemia low blood sugar and chronic kidney diseases now in chronic kidney disease it disrupts both growth hormone and the other substance called somatomedin c another name for somatomedin c is insulin like growth factor 1 now we have a hormone which is synthesized by the hypothalamus which inhibits these cells from releasing growth hormone now please realize that these are two different types of cells prolactin releasing cells and growth hormone releasing cells are two different but they are acidophilic because this is important in a tumor called pituitary adenoma in these tumors we have an excess release of prolactin and growth hormones because of overgrowth of these acidophilic cells when that happens you have symptoms of high prolactin and high growth hormone back to this states of hyperglycemia states of hyperglycemia that is high blood sugar and if you have too much somatomedin in your blood it will act as a negative feedback to inhibit release of growth hormone by increasing synthesis of somatostatin now there are analogs which we can give pharmaceutically for somatostatin which are called a drug such as octio octreotide which will also cause inhibition of growth hormone release next the functions of growth hormone now the functions of growth hormone can be either direct or it can be uh, via the production of somatomedin c in the liver now what happens there is growth hormone will stimulate the liver cells to produce somatomedin c and this has a higher half life therefore this can be measured clinically growth hormone acts the next part of the discussion is the functions of growth hormone now the first thing is growth hormone will act on bones there's the epiphyseal plate of our bones which in children and young adults will allow growth to occur growth of the bone to occur so what happens is growth hormone will come bind to these chondrocytes and cause an increase in amino acid uptake now when that happens this will also cause an increase in dna and rna synthesis this will cause protein synthesis because mrna will be produced and that will cause an increase in collagen and chondritin sulfate this will eventually lead to the cell size and number increasing so as you can see the bone will elongate now this can happen in children because they have a unfused epiphyseal plate in their bones but when it comes to adults they have a different situation these bones cannot grow in length they can only grow in width so in children you have a condition called gigantism where these children are really tall and really thin and in adults we have a condition called acromegaly so in this condition you will see the bones of the face most prominently you will see them thickened and you will see soft tissues such as the tongue as very thick so the treatment for both these conditions is a somatostatin analog octreotide now what that does is it inhibits the release of growth hormone and it stops this entire uh, cycle happening and this can be seen in pituitary adenomas so another option is surgical removal of this adenoma
that's the first function of growth hormone the second function is it acts on muscles and it causes an increase in amino acid uptake so when that happens protein synthesis will increase and that will cause the muscle to become bigger and this is called addition of lean body mass then here is the situation in which low glucose stimulates release of growth hormone so when glucose levels decrease it is detected by the ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus that will cause release of growth hormone releasing hormone eventually lead into growth hormone release and these this will cause adipocytes to undergo two situations one it increases fat breakdown and also it causes decrease in glucose uptake it prevents glucose from entering cells now that causes blood glucose levels to rise and this is also called an increase in insulin resistance so we can say this is diabetogenic growth hormone is diabetogenic growth hormone will also cause this change where it prevents glucose entering cells in other cells too such as muscle cells so now let's take a look at the regulation of growth hormone release first of all there are factors such as increasing age as you grow older the amount of growth hormone release decreases obesity also cause a decrease in growth hormone release and high glucose will also do the same during pregnancy growth hormone is released to give more amino acids to the baby so that it's not taken up by muscles and bones now a young child has high levels of growth hormone that means their lean body mass is high they have high they have more muscles they are more muscular and their mood is happier so as you grow older growth hormone levels decrease and that will cause an increase in fat deposits causing obesity and this will also lead to a decrease in mood so let's take growth hormone and its molecule that it produces through the liver somatomedin c as one entity because they act on the same pathways so growth hormone and igf1 will inhibit the anterior pituitary cells it will also inhibit the release of growth hormone releasing hormone in the hypothalamus all right so let's look at adh or vasopressin now when our blood concentration increases that is in a condition where there is less water compared to the solutes in blood our hypothalamus will detect it then it will cause the release of adh which is also called vasopressin so first of all low adh concentration that is if less adh is produced and released from the hypothalamus it will act on v2 receptors on principal cells in the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct of our nephrons so let's take a look at this the adh will come through blood and then it will act on its receptors now these receptors will cause the addition of aquaporin channels to the membrane so when those aquaporin channels are added to the membrane water will rush in if these channels were not there water will pass out and if excess water is released it will cause hypo osmolar urine now let's look at what happens inside these cells so when adh comes and binds to the v2 receptor it will cause the activation of this g protein it is called gs protein the reason for that is it is bound to a gdp now when these receptors get activated it causes gdp to be replaced by gtp and when that happens the there is a cleavage of the molecule separating the alpha s from the beta and gamma s now the alpha s alpha stimulatory will go and stimulate adenyl cyclase adenyl cyclase will cause the breakdown of atp into camp when the camp concentration increases inside the cell it will activate a protein called protein kinase a protein kinases their function is to phosphorylate other proteins or enzymes or 
even transcription factors. Now, what does that mean? As you know, ATP is made up of three high energy phosphates. Similarly, protein kinases will add a phosphate group to either enzymes, transcription factors, or to ion channels, in this case, aquaporins, activating them. So in this case, we do not have to activate an enzyme or transcription factors. Instead, we have to get more aquaporins to the membrane. This will allow water to go inside. Now, let's look at what happens when there is high ADH concentration. So when ADH is released in a higher concentration, it will cause vasoconstriction of blood vessels. Now this occurs via a different pathway. So this pathway is called the GQ coupled pathway. And this occurs when ADH will bind to V1 receptors on the membrane. The V1 receptors will cause the breaking of alpha Q from beta Q and gamma Q subunits. The same way as above. And this time the alpha Q will go and activate a protein called phospholipase C. Now phospholipase C will cleave a molecule in our membrane. It's called phosphoinositol diphosphate. So that will break down into two products. One is inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol. Let's look at inositol triphosphate. That will go to the ER, endoplasmic reticulum, and cause calcium release from it. And the calcium will go and activate a protein. It will go and activate this protein called calmodulin. From the name you can see, it means calcium modulated. So the calmodulin will activate CAM kinases. And this will cause the same three situations. It will cause an enzyme increase, transcription factors increase, or ion channels. And this, in this case, it causes calcium ion channels to increase on the membrane, which will cause an influx of calcium, causing depolarization of the cell, leading to vasoconstriction. Now, this occurs when there is low, when there is high plasma osmolarity, that means high concentration of blood. What happens if there is a low plasma osmolarity and still there is excess ADH production? That means there is an ectopic ADH production somewhere in our body. That means in a different location. So most commonly, it is because of lungs having a tumor called small cell lung carcinoma. And those cells have a paraneoplastic function. That is, in addition to its growing function, it produces other substances which are not usually done by tumors. So in this case, ADH is released even if the plasma osmolarity is low. That means there's high water in our body. So when that happens, our blood vessels will go, uh, will be filled with water and that will increase the blood pressure. So let's look at the situation in which there is diabetes insipidus. Now, in central diabetes insipidus, there is a decrease in ADH production from the hypothalamus. So, this case, there is low ADH and the patient will pass the uh, high water urine or hypoosmolar urine. We have another situation. If there is a mutation in the V2 receptor, it can cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now, what that means is the kidneys can't respond to ADH. It can also occur if these cells are destroyed. So that means ADH can be normal or high, but there is no response to the ADH. So ADH can be normal or high, but these cells cannot respond to that. And for central diabetes insipidus, we have a drug which is called desmopressin. Now that is a ADH analog. It does the same function as ADH. So we can administer desmopressin to treat these patients, which we cannot do for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. In addition, we can use desmopressin to treat nocturnal aneurysis. So what that means is passing of urine at night. You wake up because of the need to pass urine. The, ne the next topic to discuss is prolactin. Prolactin is synthesized and released from the anterior pituitary. Now, prolactin is released from acidophilic cells in the anterior pituitary. So it has a structure which is homologous to 
growth hormone. The release of prolactin depends on the following factors. When the mother hears or sees her baby cry, it will activate her higher cortex centers which will cause dopamine inhibition. It will cause the release of dopamine to be inhibited. So when that happens, the balance between dopamine and TRH will change as follows. So dopamine will go down and TRH will remain the same. Now why is this important? Because dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin and TRH stimulates the release of prolactin. So now we have TRH stimulating these cells to release prolactin. Prolactin has three main functions. It acts on GnRH, that is gonadotrophin releasing hormone, which is synthesized in the hypothalamus, and it inhibits the release of FSH and LH. So we can say it inhibits the adjacent cells in an indirect route. This will cause inhibition of ovulation and spermatogenesis. And when that happens, the patient will not have her menstrual cycle, that is called amenorrhea, and this is very important because in pregnancy, when prolactin levels are high, it will ensure that the, uh, the mother does not have a second pregnancy while the uh, mother is either breastfeeding or is pregnant. Next, in high levels, prolactin can inhibit the person's libido. It can decrease the person's libido. Now, the main function of prolactin is it causes milk production in the lobules of the mammary glands. So it will cause production of milk. The hormone which is involved in release of milk is called oxytocin. Now, the third function of this is a self-inhibition function. It does this by going and increasing the levels of dopamine. So that will cause prolactin levels to go down. Now, let's look at two conditions in which we have elevated prolactin in our blood. The first one is, during pregnancy, estrogen levels are high. So that causes an increase in prolactin. There's another situation in which prolactin can be raised, that is the use of oral contraceptive pills. The other situation is, when prolactin excretion from our body is impaired, that is, during renal failure, our body cannot remove the excess prolactin. So then, we have high levels of prolactin. Now let's look at the first situation. The first situation is a situation where there is excess prolactin produced in the body. So this could be after a chest fall injury. Let's say a patient undergoes a surgery of mitral valve replacement. So afterwards, this patient may develop hyperprolactinemia, that is high levels of prolactin in blood. And that can lead to, in a male, it can cause gynecomastia. Or in a female, it can cause tender, enlarged breasts, and also in both, you can get galactoria. The other situations include nipple stimulation by a baby that will cause an increase in prolactin release. Or it could be a tumor, a benign tumor called prolactinoma, which secretes prolactin. So what can we do to stop this excess production? We can give a dopamine analog a drug which acts the same way that dopamine does. So when we give this drug called bromocryptin, it will inhibit the release of prolactin from these cells. Situation two is one in which there is excess of prolactin produced and this could be due to estrogen being high. So the first condition could be pregnancy. The second one is the use of oral contraceptive pills. So that will cause excess prolactin to be produced. There are drugs which inhibit dopamine pathways, the tubero infundibular pathway of dopamine secretion. I will come to that next. But there are some drugs such as metoclopramide and other antipsychotics which cause a decrease in dopamine release. So when dopamine is low, the inhibition on these cells is low and that will cause an increase in prolactin release. Now, let's look at why hypothyroidism increases prolactin release. So, as you can recall, TRH is the hormone that causes prolactin to be released. So, 
if a patient has primary or secondary hypothyroidism in which the T3 or the T4 levels are low, that will cause a negative feedback in which our body tries to bring back the normal state by releasing TRH. TRH will cause the thyroid cells to produce thyroxine, but it will also cause the production of prolactin. So the prolactin levels will go up. In this situation, the TRH has gone up while the dopamine remains the same. Now, finally, what is the tubero infundibular pathway? So there are four dopaminergic pathways in our body, the mesocortical, the mesolimbic, the nigrostriatal, and the tubero infundibular pathway. Now, the tubero infundibular pathway is a closed circuit between the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So there are two nuclei in the hypothalamus, the paraventricular and the articular ar arcuate nucleus, which synthesizes dopamine, which will act on the cells that produce prolactin. Now, another name for dopamine in this situation is prolactin inhibiting hormone. 